Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mint. Before we begin, I highly encourage everyone watching to join us in the Artblocks Discord. For those watching us on the live stream, there will be people in the community chatting in the Artblocks Mint channel. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guests for this afternoon. We have generative artist Dimitri Cherniak. And we have sorry, and we have Chief of Staff at Artblocks and Artblocks Collector Kate. Hi everybody. Uh, today we're using a discussion format that we've used in the past where our guests will have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with each other. And with that being said, Kate and Dimitri, the floor is all yours. You're participating in a panel discussion at Sotheby's New York next week. Um, it's called 60 Years of Generative Art, From the Algorithm to the NFT. So what part of this retrospective are you most interested in, and why did you agree to participate? Um, you know, it's, it's one of those really interesting things. I think that in the past year, with kind of the rise in popularity of art blocks and, and generative art, um, a lot of generative artists who've been working online, who are fairly young, have, you know, gotten a lot more attention, had some kind of, you know, they, they've made the art form a little more popular. But um, Jason Bailey, aka Art Gnome, you know, he, I heard him say this a couple times, and it really kind of sat with me. He was, he was just talking about how, wouldn't it be really cool if the originators of this movement, um, you know, the, the real, you know, it'd be really special to be able to kind of put something together and, you know, kind of link those two histories, this, this history, you know, from 60 years ago um, to what we're experiencing now. And I just thought it was such a great idea and was so, so, um, you know, so excited to, to, to be a part of that. And, uh, you know, Sophia, and um, eggshells and um, you know the, the spalters were involved and it was just such a perfect mix of, of, of so many things. So I would say that it was generally a, a fairly iterative process. So I'm just gonna pull up my screen um, because you can see, I, I shared some of this the other day. Um, here we go. If you can see, you know, this is actually the, the core of the, of the algorithm. Um, and it's essentially, uh, you know, spring based physics simulation where you have all these elements and they sort of, they sort of start to expand or, you know, open up or divide or intersect. And so this is actually the, the core, um, you're, are you able to see that okay? Yeah. Yes. And then the second, the second kind of phase is uh, this polygon offsetting, which is, uh, you know, a functionality I've worked with before, but, you know, keeping things feeling very, kind of very raw, essentially applying pressure and, and opening up these, these, you know, cell like shapes, you kind of see all the interiors. And then finally, um, adding in a bit of color, you can see how the final piece, how it all works together. Um, you know, the, these, these fills, these uh, iterative colorings of the offsets as you go away and how it just all kind of comes together into this something quite special. And so, you know, the, the difference between the, the subtleties and the subtle ties is something that um, I just love to, I don't know, I think I, it makes a lot of sense when you think about these objects being connected together with kind of all these little springs, um, you know, they're all tied together and then the properties of the springs, um, you know, the coloring, how all the parameters that go into, you know, these outputs is really, um, you, you can just get so much, so much different so many different kind of outputs from this one algorithm. I think it's just kind of good luck that it also kind of 
you know, ties to the, 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 what we're doing here, which is, you know, we're, we're trying to tie these, these artists you know, who, who started producing this work in the, in the 1960s or seventies and, you know, tying it to our merit, our era now. So I, I, I feel like, you know, that was just kind of good luck, but it, it, it's, 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 it's really, um, it's really, again, just this based on the, these small, subtle differences, the cells kind of interacting together, the connections between those walls as they distort and just kind of all the different outputs you can get. I think that, um, I think that, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to, um, one sec, I'll pull up uh, Instagram just so you can see some examples because I just want to make it clear that all of these are, uh, are the same algorithm. So you can really get what I'm talking about. So, you know, this is the same algorithm, exact same algorithm uh, as that, just with different parameters. This is the same algorithm as that, just different parameters. And so just the, the subtleties affect, you know, uh, the subtle ties affect the subtleties of the piece. <laughs> so I just, I just thought it was, I don't know. I thought it was a, it was a great name and, and, uh, you know, everything just pulled together, you know, also this same algorithm and, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's kind of, you know, how, how it works for me. As I was looking at this piece and then, you know, some of the others that you're showing, reading description and thinking about this um, retrospective that's coming up, it occurred to me that it seems like maybe there's kind of a, a tension between subtle ties uh, in, ter in terms of the title and ties that bind people or things together um, with cell division that you talk about in this piece. So it's this act of both simultaneously tying things together, but also splitting things apart and seeing what comes of that division. And I wonder if that somehow ties back to this 60 year retrospective. It's a, it's a great way of thinking about it. And um, it's actually one of the things I, I like to talk about a lot when I'm introducing generative art to people. So, you know, the idea that there's this hash or there's this seed, you know, that serves as like the DNA, it's, it's you know, stored in the cell. And then the code is not like some people have kind of said like, oh, the code is the DNA, but you know, the code isn't the DNA. The code is like the mechanism that helps you express that DNA. Um, that's like how you get the actual output. The, and so like kind of like the hash with our blocks, you know, that's kind of the DNA. And then um, that, that's what you get through kind of like this minting process. And then, you, and then you have the actual mechanism of the cell, which is basically, you know, deciding what does that look like? What does that output look like? And so I think, um, again, not necessarily explicitly, but I, I, it's totally one of those things where, you know, having this, having a piece that felt organic and tied into kind of like this movement, this disruption of this, these walls is, is, is totally fitting for, for, um, you know, for, for a moment like this. So yeah, it's, 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 it's really been special. And I think for me, one of the, one of the things is that, you know, in the past, a lot of generative art was made on plotters. It was made on older computers. It was very um, rigid and sharp. It was hard to kind of get these, you know, more organic forms because of computation power or just, you know, simplicity. And so, um, you know, I was, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not, putting any of that down. I love that. Like you can look in the back, like, you know, that, that's, that's totally my jam. Um, but I just, you know, it's, I thought it was kind of an appropriate, um, you know, something, something I could contribute in this form. I personally love it. I, I worked with Sophia Garcia to pick the piece and we talked about it a lot and, you know, we have a good working relationship now. One of the fun facts about us is that, you know, in, 2018, we, we met up for the first time and we were just talking to each other and being like, why is generative art way more popular? Like, what can we do to help make it more popular? And, you know, now it, we're at this point where it is more popular. And so like, because of the work of so many different people, and it's just really cool to be able to be involved and, you know, kind of having that 
coming together with that goal and, and, and seeing, you know, so many people learn about generative art, make generative art, get into generative art, start appreciating, um, you know, this, this automation as an artistic medium and, and, and platforms like Artbox and FX hash. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really been great. Building on that, um, in your after dinner mints appearance in May of last year, you talked about wanting to spend time helping people from the traditional art world to understand this form of generative art um, and to elevate and bring recognition to generative art. So I'm curious, have you been able to spend time doing this? Uh, what have you done and how have people in the traditional art world responded? Yeah, I mean, we have. I think that this show is kind of a testament to that. You know, I'll also say, like, with this show, um, you know, we, they are giving us a platform to meet with traditional collectors and talk about this work. Um, they're bringing in, you know, expert curators on the forum, other artists, and, you know, we're going to have a, a, a critical and, uh, you know, genuine talk about the art form, its history, where it's going, what has happened. And so I think that, um, you know, this, this by itself is a great example of that. But, you know, in the past year, I, I have, you know, I've, you know, it's, it's interesting, people always joke when MoMA, you know, but you can see now they're putting out a, a you know, a Web3 associate position and, you know, gotten to interact with some people there. And they've done work with Feral File. Um, I got to go to uh, V&A, Victoria and Albert Museum, which has an unbelievable collection of early generative art and talk with them, learn more about what they're thinking, learn more about their collection. And they're so excited because, you know, they're scholars in this space that has been, um, you know, it, and everyone's, you know, always fighting to do an exhibition. And, you know, it's now there's just this like boom of people who are interested in this and they have a great collection. So you know, that was really great. Um, I got to meet, you know, with the, the, the person in charge of the museum where I grew up, which was like so cool, um, you know, got to talk to them and they had a lot of really great feedback, like interesting feedback about, you know, what they're thinking about and, uh, you know, what, what kind of like what's going on there and like how, how do NFTs and how does all of this fit in I've also had the chance to, you know, chat with a lot of traditional art collectors, like serious art collectors. And um, it's been really interesting. And, um, you know, a lot of them are, are interested. A lot of them are still figuring out how do I manage the technology required to, to do this safely. A lot of them um, are really interested. And they're like, how do I get a piece? And I'm just like, you can't. Um, but some of them have, and some of them, some of them are extremely uh, excited about it, you know, excited about it in a way that, that um, is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's absolutely impressive and, and they appreciate kind of the, the details and the nuance and, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of what I have done in the past is try to talk about the mechanism of how the art is generated because I'm trying to explain to people like wh what is special about this, like not just the straight up kind of look of the art, like the aesthetic, but like, why is this interesting conceptually? And once they get the conceptual side, which I personally think is amazing, you can start to talk about the aesthetics. And that's, and that's something that's, that's, I, I don't know, I love to do, but don't, don't get to do that much because a lot of people are, are still kind of like catching up on the mechanism. So I think we're getting a little more caught up in the mechanism. But the other thing is that there's still this association, you know, with the word NFT, with, um, you know, for, for better or worse, like profile picture. And so a lot of time when I meet with people, we'll talk about it and they'll be like, wow, I totally get, I totally get what, what this is. Like whoever explained NFT, before it was so confusing, but this makes a lot of sense. So we're still, we're still there. It's, it's, it's definitely kind of like a hot button issue and a hot topic. And I've gotten the opportunity to, you know, speak on some panels about it, um, to help people understand it. I think, you know, a year ago they were quite lively and there were some debates, 
but I think now at this point, people are starting to settle into the idea. Um, so I think in the next year, it's, it's going to get a lot more interesting. A friend of mine asked me to relay this next question to you. Uh, it pertains to existing large traditional art collections, whether they're museums or private collections, and the idea of turning these into NFTs. Um, do you see this happening as a way to track provenance or for other reasons? You know, I'm, I'm not so hot on the idea. Personally, I think that it works a lot better with like with digital, with, with something digital, to be honest. I think that if you see things like that, it won't be so much about the provenance um, because the physical item could still be stolen. Like you don't have the security of this digital network that could still be stolen. It seems like it would be more for uh, almost like the securitization, um, you know, or, or fractionalization of like the physical work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think that it makes sense to have an NFT of the Mona Lisa. I don't know. I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Got it. Okay. Shifting gears, uh, I want to delve into a project called The Rapture. Um, and I know I think you're going to share your screen. Um, I've heard people describe this project uh, as a form of performance art. Um, the project comes with a challenge. And uh, so I'll take a minute here to explain the basics for the benefit of people who may not know what, what the setup of The Rapture is. Um, the project launched four months ago and the first 50 editions were minted and sent to corresponding holders of the Eternal Pump, uh, a project you launched in February of 2021. The Rapture is technically an edition of 666 pieces, <laughs> but the holders of these first 50 Raptures can collaborate to limit the edition size to 50. So to accomplish this, though, none of the holders of these 50 raptures can list, trade, or sell their piece for one year uh, from the date the piece was minted. If everyone adheres to these rules, the project will be permanently capped at 50 pieces. But if even one collector breaks the rules, the remainder of the 666 editions will be opened up to the public for minting. Um, we're coming up on four months since the Rapture, Rapture launched in December, and so far, <laughs> knock on wood, all collectors have adhered to the rules. And uh, full disclosure for viewers and listeners, I'm one of the lucky few to have a Rapture. Um, so scarcity, I'm interested in this topic of scarcity, and I think we're going to explore it a lot um, in this conversation today. Scarcity is without question an aspect of collecting not just generative art, but more broadly, um, art in general. Uh, my fellow Rapture holders and I, we all stand to benefit if we're able to limit the edition size to 50. But doing this means we need to forego any immediate returns from selling a Rapture and instead act for the collective good. Um, I can't help but think that this year long set of rules about no listing, trading, selling might be a reaction to or a commentary on what's been happening in the NFT market. Um, so I have a few questions. Uh, first, when did you begin working on the rapture? I was working on it for a while. I think, um, I don't remember exactly, but I had an addition I had an edition for sale, I think it was maybe in March or April or something. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start thinking about kind of like the next project when, you know, this project is like, is, 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 is collected. Um, and so I think it was around then. And then basically the day that that happened, I started thinking about it. It took me, a, it took me a bit of time um, I, uh, it took me a bit of time to figure out how to do this, to give you some context. This was like when things in the summer were, were going really crazy mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, the auctions were, the, 
the Dutch auctions were just crazy. And, you know, there was a lot of intense attention and I kind of wanted to do something, I don't know, a little different, like, and, uh, I, you know, I kind of wanted to make a point, but I also wanted to, to kind of tie together the, a trilogy of, you know, drops on our blocks, um, you know, kind of the, the ringers, the palms and rapture. It's kind of like a nice trilogy, like a study of, of forms that kind of, you know, merge together. And um, the other thing is that I wanted, and again, this was kind of a, a result of the times where you know, with ringers, there was a thousand. I was happy if people minted a few and then, you know, they could put them together. Some of them might, some of them might seem somewhat average and some of them might be amazing, but when you put those two together, you know, it's something special. And so the idea with, with Rapture is like, you know, each one had to be, in my opinion, like pretty good, but then also, um, you know, something that works as an addition of 50 and then something that also works as an addition of, of 666. And so I spent a lot of time trying to aesthetically kind of gauge that distribution. Um, and so that was a lot of work. And I spent a lot of time just waiting, to be honest, like trying to think of something that was like, yes, this is something that, that works. This is kind of like a new... Um, parameter or tweak to the system and you get something interesting out of this. And, and someone commented um, about this, like the code for Rapture is extremely, I mean, aside from the actual kind of ringing, um, it's very small. It's very, very small, very little code um, to get kind of this, this interesting, you know, kind of diverse set of outputs. And so I tried to, I tried to kind of think about that and yeah, it took, it took a fair bit of time, but ultimately when it, when it was launched, um, when it was launched, I think that, um, I don't know, I think I, I achieved kind of what I wanted to do. We had a small session with everyone who, who, anyone who was going to get one could come. It was done digitally. It was done online. Um, you know, it, it felt very kind of, I don't know, like, digitally native in that regard. And we, we spoke about the outputs and all the different properties. And so it was really nice um, to be able to do that too. I think you have some pulled up. Do you want to show some? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, yeah, I know. I'm just like, you know, I think that first off, I really appreciate all the outputs. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to print some of them and they just, they look amazing and it's it's really great for me to be able to look through all of these and know that um, there's still just more to this algorithm that just hasn't been hasn't been seen and and it's 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 interesting to be able to you know kind of cut it off and still feel pretty comfortable but know that you know there's something else and then again not so much about the art but just to prove a point you know no floor price, no volume <laughs> traded. I I don't think there's another project of this stature that has something like that. So I just I'm very proud of that, uh, and I'm proud of the the crew of holders who have, <laughs> who have gone this far. You know, I said before, conceptually, you know, a group of DGENs not flipping an NFT for a year. Uh, you know, Snowfro didn't think it would last a week. And so we're four months in. So I'm, 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 I'm pretty proud of that conceptual work. What would it say to you if the holders of these first and maybe only 50 raptures are able to follow the rules for a year and, and the project is capped at 50? What would, what would that say to you? I guess there's a couple things. One, it could say that they are partaking, you know, they're, they're, they're partaking in this kind of like art event in this art project. And they have let the artists, you know, they're kind of like following the rules of the artist and they're, and they're doing that. The other side you could say is like, maybe they, 
you know, understand these ideas of scarcity and the idea that something is rare, you know, means it's more valuable to them, you know, or maybe, you know, maybe they're just, it's just fun. Like maybe they're learning a lesson about like, you know, collecting art and you don't have to sell it. You can hold it and be comfortable holding that. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just one of those things where, um, I think the whole project conceptually it, it's, it's working out and we kind of, you know, created a game that helped a lot of people think about this in a specific way and they feel incentivized to, to keep learning. Do you think that creating this incentive mechanism to act collectively uh, changes the relationship that collectors have with the artwork? Yeah, definitely. I think the other thing, and I kind of said this from the start, is you get to see a little bit, I mean, there haven't been that much pressure on, on it recently, but you get to see a little bit of like the mindset of the artist. Um, you know, I think I've seen a lot of people kind of give artists crap for... I don't know, the, the size, the addition, you know, the, the number of pieces they make. And so you get a little bit of feedback of people being like, and even if it's in jest, it's just like you actually get that feedback. Like, hey, why don't you do this so we can get this? Or like, oh, I want this piece. And normally, you know, the, the collectors of the piece aren't dealing that, with that kind of stuff. It's the artist. And so, you know, you kind of give the collector the chance to, to take part in that a bit. You said Snowfro thought it wouldn't last a week. What did you think? I thought it would last. I mean, I have to, you know, I have to believe. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense for me to do it. Like someone's got, someone's got to believe. Like, um, I don't know. I someone said this recently. They're like, you're a bit of like a romantic. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. I I I still believe that even if even if there are you know, the financialization of art, like there's still something interesting here. There's still something cool. And I'm hearing a little bit of buzzing. I am too. Uh, we've mentioned that it was holding an internal pump that enabled a collector to mint a rapture. Um, this mechanism seems designed to at least in part reward early collectors do you think that this mechanism would become more widely used? And are there trade-offs you consider when making art available to only certain collectors? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, there are definitely trade-offs to it. It definitely is a way to collect, to, you know, reward early collectors. Uh, it's definitely fair, but, you know, I think that the pump in particular had a, bit of like a rocky beginning and I felt that you know it was an interesting way to be able to do this and still have a small enough scale to kind of try things out myself like again I say automation is my artistic medium but I also like to kind of go through manually all these steps just to really kind of understand the problem at hand and so it allowed me to it allowed me to kind of develop relationships with each and every one of the holders to kind of like learn about them, to get to know them. You know, we, 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 we've even had dinners, you know, together in, in person a, a couple times. And so it was really, um, it was, it was, it's been a really interesting process to get to know everyone and, and get to know a bit of their background. And so I, I guess, it's, it was, it was good for me and I, I plan to keep doing it. You know, I don't necessarily know the cadence of when I'm going to do it, but if I have fun ideas, you know, it's like, these are the people that I'm going to roll with. Um, We're, I think I can speak for all of us. We're here for it, Dimitri. Bring it on. <laughs> um, you talked at length in your last after dinner mints in May of last year about ringers. So I, I don't think we're going to go into too much detail um, about it, but I do want to at least give folks uh, maybe who weren't around a year ago uh, in this space a little bit of background. Um, so the project launched on January 31st of last year. It was an addition of a thousand pieces. And as you said earlier, you hoped some collectors would want to collect multiple pieces um, and kind of curate grids and put the 
maybe the ones that were less remarkable next to ones that really stood out and kind of that collectively um, elevated the set. And to enable this, you priced ringers at 0.1 ETH, which it shocks me to say this, this was $130 at the time, if I do my math right. <laughs> um, so how did the launch of ringers and this past year go compared to what you imagine might happen, uh, both for yourself and for the wider community of generative artists? I mean, I never, I don't know, I never could have imagined it. It's, um, it was, it was just, you know, perfect moment. I think it was the right project. It was something that was simple and people could understand conceptually. And then you start to put them together and you can see very clearly um, just the, the power of the algorithm, how much flexibility there was and that I left it, you know, out of my hands. And um, yeah, the, the, uh, the idea of just, you know, kind of like this, this latent beauty, this emergent beauty that can exist in this set. Um, and, you know, I was sharing tons of sets, you were sharing tons of sets that really helped a lot of people um, understand it. And I was just going to share this because, you know, it's so cool to see to this day, people are kind of still <laughs> digging into that. And so you can see the distribution of all the um, background color ringers. This is uh, made by Hilbert Space, uh, who has just, you know, recently been on a tear in terms of curating ringers to help showcase kind of the, the power of the underlying algorithm. And so you can just see here kind of the distribution of all the colors. And, you know, for a lot of people, they, they saw this and they were like, oh, wow, like you thought really carefully about these distributions and kind of what it would look like. And yeah, it was, yeah, I did. Uh, and then, well, let's go back here this way, I think. Then we got a Ponyo ringer. Uh, <laughs> um, and then this was, you know, I, after I saw that first one, I think I kind of, someone mentioned something and then I joked about the periodic table of ringers. Uh, and they put this together, which is just so cool. Um, the idea that, you know, you're classifying these ringers kind of visually in a structure in a similar way that, you know, the idea of having like a periodic table. Um, and like I joked, you know, they even got all the lanthanides and actinides. Um, and, and it was just, it was really, I don't know, amazing for me for to see new people kind of discover the algorithm and the output and just how you can put them together. So it, it, it makes me really happy that that's still going on. And I wanted to show this um, because I feel like it's it's kind of like important and it was one of my my kind of like inspirations when I was thinking about ringers. So Ligia Pape, a Brazilian artist, and um, you know, she has a work called the uh, Libro do Tempo. Uh, and it's just kind of like, it, when you when you like, you know, when I when I first kind of saw this coming together, it really reminded me of this, um, which, you know, again, not made by computer, but feels very generative. And again, this tie to um, this, 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 this tie, you know, to art that's existed before and kind of like creating these, these small multiples, as they would say, um, in kind of like information theory or data visualization and you know, so it's not something that's that's brand new. Um, but what's cool here is, you know, I'm not carving each one of these. I'm not deciding what it looks like. They're kind of created en masse with the with the collective and then people are kind of arranging them in their own ways. And so um, it's really cool. And also, I didn't realize one of the curators, this is one of my favorite exhibitions ever. It was in the Met Brewer, um, I think, in 2017. I don't remember exactly, or 2018. Um, believe it or not, one of the curators is also like a unbelievably knowledgeable in um, computer and new media art, uh, Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan. And so it's been, it's just so interesting because this, this, that whole exhibition felt almost like a generative art ex exhibition um, in, in many ways, maybe one of the reasons why I loved it so much. But um, it's cool to see that all, I don't know, like everything kind of tie in together. Um, we touched on the topic of scarcity when we talked about the rapture 
um, and your latest project, Dead Ringers, uses this concept of scarcity as the core theme. And I know you have a lot to say about this, this deeply meaningful project. Um, so I'd love to take some time and kind of explore this. Why don't we start by having you describe uh, what you did for the first 30 days of January of this year for Dead Ringers? Yeah, if we could just take down the, the browser. Thanks. Um, Dead Ringers was very much a celebration of, to me, the, the birth and the death of Ringers, this one year period. You know, I basically what happened is for the 30 days leading up to the anniversary of Ringers, I would generate an output um, using similar like Ringers algorithm, not the exact one that I did in for actual Ringers. And then, um, you know, fill it in with this kind of triangular subdivision and then adding um, adding circles in the insets and of, of those uh, recursive triangles and just drawing them a little messy, the lines a little messy. And it felt, you know, a bit like each one was, was kind of rotting, kind of, you know, it, it, it wasn't this <laughs> happy-go-lucky um, piece like you know like ringers was it was it was kind of the the death the death of ringers um the what i was doing is i was generating these pieces and then sending them out to entirely generated wallets <laughs> so what that means is that you know people talk about airdrops or these things i was doing airdrops and then i was you know picking a random wallet but the thing is is the the space that exists of the number of potential random wallets is so huge that it's just impossible to have gotten one. And um, to give you some context, I, I did like some calculation. It was like for there for there to be like a reasonable chance to get one, I would have had to do this every day for forty million times the length of the universe till now. <laughs> um, and it was fun because people started generating millions of wallets. Uh, they were running computers being like, oh my God, like I gotta get one. Like, this is so rare. Uh, and so, yeah, like, you know, people were doing that. And I, you know, I thought it was interesting. I, I figured there's always kind of this disconnect, I think between um, math and statistics and, and kind of from a lot like the general public in some ways. And so, you know, I, I figured there might be stuff like that but just like kind of when you see it, it, it's, I don't know, it just kind of like reinforces again, like how much of this technology, how much of the ideas behind it are still so disconnected from a lot of the people who are, you know, even using it. Um, and so, you know, that was, that was something interesting. And then, you know, basically you know, for the first 30 days, it just, it was like this performance. People were mad at me, people were <laughs> mad at me away, you know, this could change someone's life, like, you know, just, is I'm taking this in as feedback, like it's not judgmental, like I'm, I'm performing this act. And so, you know, I'm eliciting reactions and emotions and I'm, you know, using, I mean, the position I have to, to, to at least have people contend with these ideas. Um, and then on the last day, I kind of flipped the script and I was like, hey, now this piece, I'm going to put it in a grid and then send that to a wallet. And then for the next 24 hours, anyone, well not, sorry, any wallet, any wallet can get exactly one of these. And um, it was like, even in the solidity code, like it was programmed in, like there can be no more than the number of wallets, potential possible wallets. And even though, that it doesn't make sense like that you could ever have that many because i don't think there's enough energy like in the world in the universe, <laughs> to have that many be created or even that much ethereum like exists to have that many be created but you know the idea that um you know the idea that there is just one per wallet uh, and they can mint it and uh and that ran for, for 24 hours. And then kind of the whole, 
the, the point I was making at the end of this was, um, you know, all of this, all the funds from, from this are going to uh, my local food bank. So tell us how many were minted. I don't. I don't remember exactly. Um, I think there was 24,000 or 23,000. And so, um, yeah. Yes. Who's that? Luke, you're not muted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so um, I think it was like 24,000 something. And, uh, and uh, what percentage? Well, right. So this is the whole thing is what percentage of that is 16 to the power of 40. That is 0%. And so with a 0% sold out mint, we managed to fund about 16 million meals for the food bank for New York, which is more than one meal for every new year. I think that's about 16% of all of the meals they serve in a, any given year. I just get goosebumps every time I think about this. It's just really an incredible, incredible project and an incredible outcome. How did the food bank react to this? They, they were pretty started going and then I emailed them and I said, hey, do you accept cryptocurrency? Um, how about... like over a million dollars and they called me <laughs> immediately <laughs> and were you know wanted to learn more and so ultimately um with that project they they weren't able to accept crypto yet however you know got to speak a little bit about what their options were and they now do accept crypto um, which is, which is great. I think the, they settled on, you know, using the giving block and they kind of, um, understood kind of what a powerful. Let's say that so many people were motivated to buy something that is the complete opposite of scarce. Anybody who wanted one and had 130 ish dollars could have minted one. What, what does that say kind of to your deeper thinking about scarcity? I mean, I posted about this the other day because a lot of people have been asking me about it. Um, it kind of requires me to take off my artist hat a bit. I don't really want to do that in this forum, um, but I think that I think that there's a couple things. One is that people care about the art. You know, people got people got you know held my whatever because I knew what I was going to do anyway. Um, and so, so yeah, sorry, I forgot a bit what, what we were getting at there, but, but yeah, what, what does it mean? Well, a couple things. One is that when you make something that is hard to get, which again, one of the reasons why I did ringer is, was because it was hard to get my, my individual pieces mm -hmm. for, for collectors. And, you know, this allowed a lot of people to have something that, you know, they, they, they care about, or, or maybe they fetishize, um, maybe, you know, maybe it's, it's kind of the money or maybe it's the, the status that it now has. I, like, I don't know exactly, but you know, we were able to funnel all of that, whatever this weird thing is that exists, this, this, this D gen nature, this, this, um, a, 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 like, appreciation of art, this appreciation of aesthetics, this appreciation of funnel all of that towards something that is, I mean, fundamentally about love. So, yeah. Have any of the artists that were treat, tweeting crap at you come back uh, now that the project is complete and they've seen the impact? Has anyone kind of come back and... Yeah, I do. I do. I want to <laughs> ask you because I feel like um, I feel like one uh, 
besides me, you're probably like the number one expert of ringers, but I, I guess <laughs> um, a couple of things like we've known each other for like a year now. You've gone from dabbling in NFTs, you know, to now an executive at probably <laughs> one of the most prominent organizations in the space. So I guess like I would want to know how you describe your journey to um, to outsiders, you know, who might not know about NFTs. Like, how do they do they understand it? Do they understand you? Like, I just love to learn more. Yeah, that, the answer is they don't always understand. Sometimes it takes a couple passes. Um, a bit of my background, I found my way to art blocks uh, when my brother, who's a an early member of Flamingo Dow told me that Artblox was doing something really interesting. This was um, December of 2020, about a month after Artblox had launched. Um, I'd been doing some real DGen DeFi stuff in like the 90 days leading up to that and woke up on Christmas Day 2020 with, I think it was a one inch airdrop worth about $25,000 that I immediately sold. And, uh, you know, my brother saying art blocks is doing something interesting. Art seemed a lot more fun than goofing around with one inch and, and other stuff. So, um, it took me a couple of weeks, but I, I got over to art blocks, um, minted a couple of things. Um, so, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to people about my journey to art blocks, I always start with ringers. Um, ringers was really the kind of the project that sent me down the rabbit hole that I have, I think still not found the bottom of that rabbit hole and uh, thoroughly enjoy it. Um, before ringers, I had minted a few things, um, but I really didn't at that point, understand what generative art was. I just really had no clue. Um, Ringers was announced and I watched the interview that you did with Sofia Garcia of Artex Code. And in that interview, you showed examples of the algorithm, the Ringers, uh, kind of the core Ringers algorithm that you've been iterating on, I think for years at that point. And you showed some other outputs and some one of ones that had come from that algorithm. And I just thought those, uh, those pieces were absolutely um, gorgeous. And so I became really intrigued with this project. I think this was a couple of weeks before it launched. Um, and then you minted, uh, I think a full thousand test mints of ringers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, art blocks, we don't, we don't do that now. I think maybe it's a, a cost. Yeah, you know, there's a cost to doing that. Um, you know, for people who may not know the purpose of test mints, uh, you know, it's a chance for the artist to uh, run the algorithm in a kind of live environment um, to test to make sure that everything's working uh, before the project is launched. And, uh, you know, for me, it was just a really fascinating um, way to kind of engage with this project. Ringers launched on a Sunday, and I remember very clearly spending the whole Saturday <laughs> before the launch looking at these uh, thousand testaments and trying to understand almost in a way of kind of reverse engineering. I wanted to understand the components that went into a ringer, the different variations that were possible, kind of the frequencies and distributions and how different traits uh, work together. And I wanted to understand and I came to understand that individual pieces were unique and interesting and beautiful. And yet when you kind of combine them with others and you look at them in the context of the whole project, um, that for me was really the light switch for me where I just started to have that first inkling of what generative art is. Um, so, you know, for me, that light bulb moment of ringers and looking at the individual pieces in the context of the whole. When I'm talking to people about my journey and when I'm explaining generative art um, on demand, um, on chain generative art specifically, you know, I start with ringers and I always try when I can to get in front of a screen with someone or do a screen share and kind of walk through and look at these projects, look at this project together and some other projects together. Um, because for me, that's really when people start to understand what generative art is. And I think start to understand that it's incredibly hard to create an algorithm that has 
produces so much variety and beauty um, in pieces that are unique but interrelated. Um, so for me, you know, it, it, it really is about kind of showing people individual pieces in the context of, of bigger projects, and then also um, pointing them to some really good reading by people like Tyler Hobbs. And kind of the combination of those two things is really where people can kind of start to understand uh, and engage with the art. Yeah, it's, 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 it makes sense. Like, I think for me, like, yeah, Ringers is this almost like, you know, the art is, is, is the set. Um, I mean, it helps that, you know, we got the goose and we got the <laughs> uh, like, it, and again, those are things that I never would have imagined or like, you know, 109, it like, it helps, but it's really, you know, it's kind of this meta set, um, which kind of is like good segue into the next thing, which is you've made your mark for your attention to detail and curatorial eye. Um, what interests you about curating sets and like, what do you look for? Yeah, uh, I love curating. <laughs> <laughs> my my first attempts at curation happened after the Ringers launch. Um, you know, I was still really new to generative art. I spent all those hours looking through the testaments, kind of looking for that connective tissue. And when I first started, I was really focused on kind of the named traits. So let's just continue talking about Ringers, the number of pegs and the wrap style and uh, colors, etc. And what I would do is after uh, Ringers launched, I would uh, look through all of Ringers, all the thousand real Ringers, and I do kind of a right click save creating uh, kind of a grid and would share them in the discord. And I focused on the name traits. So whether they were, I don't know, small boys or the beige backgrounds or whatever it might be, um, you know, kind of as a way kind of a process of discovery and sharing with what at the time was a really small Discord community. Demetri, I think you said, I, I didn't know this at the time, but I think maybe there were like 90 people or 100 people in Discord at the time. So it was a pretty small group. And, uh, you know, you, you answered hundreds of questions, I think just for me <laughs> alone in Discord. And it was really fun to kind of, you know, share these sets and, and it was a way to explore the project. Um, at some point for me, kind of you know, later, I became interested in looking at uh, maybe the less obvious connective tissue between ringers. Um, and so, you know, this was really about the, the aspects that weren't necessarily deliberately uh, created by you. You mentioned the goose, right? You didn't, there was no part of the algorithm that said, you know, create something that looks a lot like a goose. Um, but you know, serendipity, but we got that and it's, and it's amazing. So I was kind of looking for these emergent properties, um, which was really things that happened because the algorithm, um, the algorithm and randomness came together to produce something. Um, and I, you know, from memory my favorite example was having looked at ringers for hours and hours and hours, I noticed that there were some that had symmetry. And I wondered how many there were. And I really went through all 1,000 ringers. And I, as I recall, there were nine that had symmetry. And it turns out it's really hard. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that was something that you designed in the algorithm. And no. when, I, when I shared that grid with you, you were just delighted. Like you were really excited. You asked if you could tweet it. And that was just so fun for me. Um, uh, so that was kind of my, you know, my second phase was to look at start to look at the art in ways and look at that connective tissue between pieces um, for things that you hadn't necessarily deliberately expressed as possibilities. Um, and then I guess the third phase of my curation was, um, I kind of see it now as a way to have a conversation with people, um, with the artist, with other collectors, um, it feels participatory to me, curation does. Um, with on-demand generative art, Dimitri, you're not curating these pieces. A thousand ringers exist and you didn't get to 
curate them. I think there's one that you might wish didn't exist, but we won't talk about that one. Um, so in a way, it almost felt like the, the act of curation was handed over to the collectors. Uh, and I really, really love that. And for me, it's just really kind of an opportunity to explore art in more depth and to have a conversation. Um, I have, I mean, I have good friends who we spend hours looking at, at uh, generative art and working on curation together and have um, heated debates and disagreements about curation. And I love that. I absolutely love it because it gives me an opportunity to see art in a different way through the lens of other people and the way that they see uh, this art as being interrelated. So yeah, that's what I, that's what I love about curation and kind of why I like doing it. Um, I'm interested in your perspective on curation. Um, how, how do you think the role of curation, what's its importance within the world of generative art um, versus traditional art? It's a really tough question. Um, I think there are probably good answers to it, um, but it might also kind of be personal. I think on, on my side, showing the juxtaposition or showing the outputs or showing the diversity has always been how I've generally thought about it. So I always feel like you want to show iterations um, of this work. And um, that brings so much more to it. And it's not so much as necessarily like, you know, showing water lilies, like all the different water lilies, because that's more or like, you know, a room of Rothko's, like that's more about like a vibe. But with this, I think, I think you can, you can, you can show them together. Um, and it's more about, it's more about putting them together. And that makes kind of like the meta algorithm, the, the art piece. And so um, it doesn't always work. You can't always make things that way. I feel like it's, it's tougher to do that now, at least on like art blocks, because it's kind of so high intensity the minting situation, which makes it tougher to, to do something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think ultimately still there's a concept or there's an idea and you just get to maybe pick a few more of your favorites out of it instead of just like getting that direct work from the artist. So maybe it's, it's curation in that way is more important uh, at least in terms of maybe like visual, like it doesn't necessarily, when you like, when you talk about like the emotional value of, of art or the conceptual art, right? Like that, that type of curation is, is always important. Um, and sometimes, you know, the artist doesn't necessarily know what they're, what they're even making at the time. Like you could be working on something and you don't know why you're doing it. You don't know what the, the thing is, but, and so this is why I always say like working with curators is actually extremely important because someone who, someone who asks you, who can ask you those questions or can maybe be like, do you know, because curators generally, they're looking at a lot of art. They know a lot of artists. So like, do you know this work? Do you know this work? Like, do you know why this person was, was, was making their work? And so, you know, for me, that was like a, a huge, that was a huge step personally, um, you know, working with, with, with curators who help, who help me kind of push my, practice or how I thought about art forward. And so, you know, I think that as an artist working with curators is really important because they know all the stuff about the art, they have the mm -hmm. eye for these things and, you know, maybe they can teach you about something. But then when you talk about actually just like aesthetically, I think um, with generative, it's, it's almost the reflection maybe is like the curation is almost as important as the art at times. Um, hmm. depending on what you want to convey and the artist is more giving you a whole bunch of options and you can kind of say something with it like for example you could imagine you know just a, a grid of all the dark mode ringers and like it's pretty somber but also it's pretty awesome <laughs> you could take you know all the ones that look like puppies 
And so I, you know, it, it's just like one of those things where you can, and it's not even necessarily about the artist's, you know, intent. <laughs> like it wasn't my goal to to make a necessarily like a happy set, or it was, you know, it was to take this concept and and help people learn about generative art. So, um, yeah. So it seems like you enjoy seeing how people are curating sets of your work. Yeah, I mean, it, it's 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 great. And like, you know, it's, it, you know, I, I, there's a whole other set of like, you know, I've seen so many, I've seen so many. And so whenever I see something new, it's just, I don't know, just a testament to me of the, the power of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily about me as an artist. It's, it's, it's more just kind of like, you know, you get to like crack the egg and the egg, you know, make, give, gives you the great taste. Um, but yeah. Um, all right. I have one more question for you. Sure. Sure. Um, NFTs, you could argue that without the lockdown, the COVID lockdown, NFTs wouldn't be the same that they are today. They, it was one of the, potentially one of the reasons why they, they came mm -hmm. to popularity. So as restrictions are loosening up now, how do you think the ability to have, you know, real face-to-face -face interactions um, is going to change things with NFTs and this, this, this digital world? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if this is a direct answer to your question, but what comes to mind is, um, you know, I'm really excited to have the opportunity uh, to enjoy this art with people in physical spaces. Um, I have really vivid, fond memories of uh, us being in Miami Beach at Art Basel for the digital exhibition in December of last year. And I don't know if you remember, Dimitri, at one point we were sitting on a bench, uh, I don't know, maybe 25 feet from the display of your for printed ringers. These were, this was a huge, really amazing space. The ringers were printed. Each ringer was, I think it was three feet square, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as you and I were sitting there kind of chatting, we were, I don't know, 25 feet from the ringers and, and I would see groups of people walking through the exhibition come up to the ringers. And they would generally stand kind of because the ringers were big, they would stand pretty far back, 10 feet, 15, 20 feet back. Often they were in groups of two or three people and, and they would start talking and I couldn't hear what they were saying. We were too far away, but um, you could tell, or I, I, I at least inferred from their body language and how they were animated and pointing at the ringers and kind of pointing as they were talking and sort of telling what seemed to me like a story of the interconnectedness of these ringers. Um, it just seemed really apparent to me that people were really curious and were really looking very closely um, at the art. Um, so I think an important part about this anecdote is that these ringers were printed. This was your intention, as I understand it, when you did this project, you were hoping that people would want to have these printed and I know you offer them signed. Um, so because of the lockdown, people were not able to you know, go to exhibitions nearly as much. Um, and the way that we've been experiencing this art has been online and it hasn't been a communal in-person kind of experience. So, you know, what I hope is that now that we could do these kind of face-to-face -face interactions, we're gonna have more experiences where we can go to things like the digital and we can see that there are many ways that you can live with this art in your life, whether it's, digital or printed or holograms or projected or other ways um, that there's just a, a, a rich variety of ways that you can experience and have this art in your life. And I think experiencing it with other people and having that chance to talk at and look at and be in the presence of this art in different forms is really powerful. So that's, that's how I think it might change this year is with those in-person experiences. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I guess speaking of that, like, sorry, I can, if we can just share my screen, the, um, you know, the, the natively digital, one of the really great things is that all of these works, um, are, you can go see them. So you can go to Sotheby's, um, New York from the, I think 19th, to the 24th, 
and you can see you can see all these works um, in person. And that I don't know. That's something I'm I'm excited about. Like obviously, like I think that the idea of the NFT as the digital work is like what makes sense. Like to me, that's it. Just it just makes sense at this point. Like the idea that this work is digital. It's stored there. This is kind of the proof of ownership, and it's on this super secure system. Like to me, that's just that's just table stakes at this point. But it's really cool to be able to go and see this work next to each other, kind of see the story of generative art. You know, again, like Charles Surrey, who just who recently passed away, unfortunately, like just before the show. Again, just an innovator in 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 computer art and computer graphics, Vera Molnar, who again is the grand dame of, of generative art, someone who conceptually was playing with these ideas before they had access. And then, you know, they got to actually have access um, on this computer and, you know, can actually, could actually do these things, which is just like amazing. Um, and then also Roman uh, Verostko, uh, which, um, who, again, you know, th these, these artists have been working in this, in this form for so many years. And, um, you know, this isn't even the whole story of the origin of generative art. This is, you know, kind of focused more on a, a specific region. Like, you know, you also have innovators like from in, in Argentina and Asia. Um, but it's, it's cool to be able to have at least one part of that story being told physically. Um, and then again, the AI generative art with some really mm -hmm. fantastic artists. Um, and then, you know, finally, like some of the people you might know from, from <laughs> or, Indeed. you know, or, or NFTs and having, you know, having these, these pieces all together is just, it's, that's going to be so cool. And again, uh, in New York, Sotheby's New York from the 19th to 24th, uh, I hope that if you're interested, you get a chance to go and see it in person because, um, yeah, the, the, the pieces in person are really great. Well, Dimitri, I always enjoy catching up with you. And uh, if you have as productive a 2022 as you did last year, then I think we should make a date. Let's come back on after dinner mints in a year uh -huh. and let's catch up again um, about all the amazing stuff you've done. Yeah, we've got, got a couple couple projects. I've shared a bit of some of it. I don't want to go to into too deep, but hopefully, you know, we'll get to address this whole, uh, what's the floor of ringers. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. But... I look forward to that. Thanks, Dimitri. Okay. Masood, I, I can't hear you at least. <laughs> I should say Panya. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I just want to thank Dimitri and, and Kate so much for being on After Dinner Mints. It's always a pleasure to have each of you on here because you bring so much to the table as far as like generative art and then bringing these different perspectives. So I truly appreciate you being on. Um, I have a couple news and notes that I want to provide. Uh, everyone tuning in on next week's After Dinner Mints, we have a pre-recorded Art Blocks. Uh, we have a show with Art Blocks COO Zero X Houston. That show will be released on April the twentieth, starting at midnight Eastern. Uh, we talk Power by Art Blocks, Zero X Houston's art collection, and other happenings within the Art Blocks world. Uh, we have a Twitter Spaces discussion called Mentors and Makers. This is a weekly show with a variety of artists, collectors, and other notable community members with conversations surrounding art. Uh, our next discussion will be tomorrow. That's Thursday, April the 14th at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We have Andrew Bader, Emily Edelman, and Dima Offman. So really looking forward to that one. And finally, we have a weekly newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming drops and generative art-related news. You can find a link to that in the description of the YouTube video. Uh, I also want to make a note that this is the last show I'll be doing IRL with Luke. So I just wanted to give him a huge shout out for the last 40 plus episodes we've been doing with After Dinner Mints uh, in his studio. Um, don't worry though, After Dinner Mints isn't going anywhere. We're still doing this. Uh, we're still going to have this weekly show that I really love putting on. And 
we're just going to be uh, doing this uh, remotely. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to Luke. Thank you so much for, um, yeah, just for everything. It's been a wild journey this past year and excited to always put these shows together. Uh, and finally, thank you to Kate and Dimitri again for being our special guests and joining me on After Dinner Minutes this afternoon. Comment, like, and subscribe to the Art Blocks YouTube channel. Be kind to each other. Remember to buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Congrats. It's good to be back. Cool. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.